All right, looks like we have everybody on here to go ahead and get started. So my name is Dr. Brett Wisniewski, and you're joining in to listen to Stop the 30-Day Detox, the Science and Strategies for Proper Biotransformation. Some of my presentations are known to be pretty dense, but I don't, I don't think it's fair for the general public to kind of get a dumbed-down version of how the body works. We're going to keep it pretty heavy, and I'll simplify it and also give you some take-home messages uh, towards the end. You also have a chance to ask questions, so feel free to go ahead and e email those to me, and if we have time at the end, I will be able to answer them. Here's a quick disclaimer. I pride myself in providing the most up-to-date research, literature, and clinical outcomes. The following has not been evaluated or approved by the FDA nor its governing bodies. Recommended dosages are for adults, and as always, any treatment should be monitored by a licensed physician. I do not encourage any person to lessen or discontinue any prescription medication or prescribed nutrition without consulting with a prescribing doctor first. This is really important because you want to create a healthcare team with your physician, doctor, or therapist so everybody's on the same page and you can get the best results possible. Who am I? I'm a doctor of chiropractic practicing natural medicine in Bertha, Colorado. I've been a clinical consultant for a number of years for both uh, you know, practitioners and also some nutraceutical companies. I have over 10,000 hours in nutrition, uh, immunology, and mitochondrial medicine. Let's dive right into it. Detoxification uh, really is, is ideal if it's performed every single day. Having these 30-day programs or you know your 10-day detox or these special juices sometimes can be harmful, and, and this is why I wanted to create this presentation is to go through the entire process. So the goal of any detoxification program should be the promotion of health and improvement on the inherent fundamental mechanisms and not reliance on substances. So we want our body to be able to detoxify without these specialized, you know, concoctions per se. Not to, you know, discount the strength and power of adding nutrients, uh, but but we really want to see the body be able to do it on its own. So I feel that these detoxification or can detoxification programs, they're expensive. Number one. Uh, and they can be a little bit extreme, you know, whether there's a, you know, a really long period of fasting. Uh, they promote stress response and they actually increase inflammation. And I'll show you how that happens. The idea would be to promote detoxification every day. So detox as you retox. Supplement with nutrients to build overall health and wellness. So not just specific nutrients to help the detoxification process, but if we can kind of, you know, for lack of a better term, get two birds with one stone and get you nutrients to not only help you get rid of some of these waste products, but also just you know the general mechanisms of vitality. Uh, that would be ideal. So why do we need to detoxify? Well, you know, even if you live a really clean life, you know, you exercise, you eat organic, non-GMO, uh, there's still some things that we just can't get away from. And here's some examples. So we have industrial compounds, uh, you know, incineration, burning waste products or creating energy. Uh, abundance of pesticides, herbicides, and, and food additives. I don't know if anybody can really get away from those unless you're in isolation somewhere. Uh, the, the new hot topic is genetic modification of food and foodstuffs. We have synthetic medications. And then cosmetic additives These are interesting. I, I get a lot of patients say, well, it's just on my skin. And they don't really believe that it's absorbed. Uh, and I, I think I have a few research articles in here to, uh, to prove I think I have a few research articles in here to show you uh, how harmful some of these cosmetic additives can be. In 2012, the World Health Organization estimated around 7 million people died as a result of air pollution. That's one in eight in total global deaths. So that's, that's a pretty impressive number. So why do we care? Okay, so this is all around us all the time. Why is it important? Well, this is a compound called flalates. And flalates are, are very common in uh, plastic bottles, whether it's water bottles or Tupperware that you put your lunch in every day. We find them in hairsprays, perfumes, uh, some of the wiring around the house, children toys. So wh what can what can happen if we have an, an increased ex exposure to flalates? If, as you see, they're pretty ubiquitous. They're everywhere. So we can't get away from them completely. So what should we do? We should help the body get rid of them regularly. Here's a little research article I pulled up for you guys. I see a lot of females... Uh, come into the office with osteoporosis, and, and it amazes me that over the past couple of years, they're they're younger and younger. 
And it really caused me some interest and in, in to really go out there and find out what possibly could be the cause. This is an article that shows the correlation between urinary flailate metabolites and low bone mineral density in older women. It said urinary flailate me metabolites were associated with low bone mineral density and high osteoporosis risk in postmenopausal women. Our findings suggest that background flailate exposure may unfavorably affect bone homeostasis. Pretty interesting, uh, and, and your doctor can test for flailate exposure. Here's some other things that increased toxicity could cause. We have diabetes, multiple sclerosis, fatigue, pain, inflammatory bowel disease, autoimmune, osteoporosis, brain fog, mental fatigue, learning disabilities, and some of the neurodegenerative conditions. This is, if you look at this picture, you can see the current pathologies that plague America. It's all of them. So toxicity has to be a topic of discussion that you're having with your doctor uh, to find out how to properly detoxify some of these harmful chemicals. And like I said, we're exposed to them every day, 24 seven. So these 30 day programs just aren't gonna cut it. You need to really learn how to supply yourself with the nutrients that promote proper detoxification or biotransformation every single day. Dioxins is another uh, common chemical. It's spread in the air. It stays airborne pretty long. It's not metabolized by bacteria, whether it's in the environment or in the body, which makes it very, very harmful, and it stays reactive for a long period of time. Its half-life is pretty long. It's 25 to 100 years. And where do we find it? Uh, you can see the little pict pictorial down at the bottom, uh, waste incineration. It's byproducts of paper and steel. Uh, if you're near a volcano, you know it, you can have some excess dioxin exposure. And then we find it in some of our food products like beef and dairy. So before we move any further, you're going to see that I'm, I'm adding uh, some research in here. And like I said, I, I don't, I didn't want to dumb this down for the general population. I really wanted you to see what this looks like, how you know different physicians look at this this type of information. So uh, if anything just doesn't make any sense, like I said, you can always ask a question, or I will try and give you the take home message at the end of the slide or the end of the presentation. Here we're looking at dioxin and its possible effects on neonatal tissue. So before the baby is even born, dioxin and dioxin-like chemicals upregulate a specific protein. We're gonna see that this protein is very important in detoxification. What they did in here is they took 164 placental tissues, also mentioned that the mothers had no thyroid problems whatsoever. They, they tested them in blood, and they also showed no symptomatology of any kind of thyroid disruption. But what they found is in 132 of the placental tissues, this dioxin increased that protein so much that it started to disrupt the neonatal or fetal thyroid gland and endocrine system. So they thought, okay, well, let's retest the mother after birth. And they did that. And the mother still came out with perfect thyroid function. Uh, the blood chemistries were fine and she showed no symptomatology, which would lend itself to see how powerful these different chemicals can be and how they can skip over a generation, if you will, and start to affect our babies even before they're born. So it's really important that biotransformation and detoxification is part of your prenatal planning. And if a similar chain of events occurs in other tissues such as the fetal brain, it could explain the relationship between prenatal exposure to PCBs and cognitive deficits in the offspring. So here we're just talking about more exposure to the mother uh, with the unborn child. So monitoring thyroid hormone is something that's very, very common in pregnancy. And, uh, you know, you know I, I see a lot of pregnant women in my practice and, and they come in with pre-existing blood work and there's always thyroid panels ran on there. And I think that's important. But if you can, you know, now we can start to see some of this information and some of the other things we need to do to be more comprehensive when it comes to prenatal planning. I put this in here and uh, I, I can't remember the source, so in all fairness, uh, th this isn't something that I made. I did find this. And it just shows you the chemical compounds, what you know tissue could be affected. And here we're still talking about neonatal endocrine system, and then the effects. So you know you have some of your heavy hitters like mercury and lead, and then we have some of the hydrocarbons and the pesticides and organophosphates. So you guys can go back to this um, and take a look uh, just as a reference. Some of the foods that we consume every day, we now consider toxic. Modified fructose, I mean, I think this is this subject matter has been beaten to death, but I think it's important to mention here, uh, you know, we're talking about high fructose corn syrup, uh, gluten, grains, cow dairy, and all the diet substances, the diets, you know, sodas, 
any kind of the uh, artificial sweetener diet products, you know, to lessen the calories. Uh, in my honest opinion, you're doing more harm than good, and there's better ways to uh, cut the calories or lose weight. And biotransformation is one of those. The, uh, the toxins that you're exposed to accumulate in adipose tissue or fat tissue. So if we have less toxins, the body has to manufacture less fat. That's another reason why I stress the importance of detoxification. There's another article on flalates. Uh, urinary excretion of flalates and paraben after repeated whole body topical application in humans. This goes back to that argument I talked about before with the, the lotions and creams that the patients, you know, they, they, they really don't think it's absorbed and it's just doing something good for the skin. <clears throat> in this article, they actually found three chemicals are systemically absorbed, metabolized, and excreted in the urine following application in a cream preparation. Now that, this article wasn't to say that they were necessarily bad, but it was showing the conversion from the skin and then through the whole metabolic process and finally winding up as a waste product. So if you have these cosmetative additives, they sometimes have synthetic hormones in them. They have uh, you know, some of these harmful chemicals that we really don't want. So make sure you're buying a good quality product because they will eventually wind up in your system and your body will have to detoxify and putting stress. Uh, flalates are even used in enteric coating in some medications. Some of the things we take to you know, possibly get us better are actually coated with these harmful flalates, so it's important to know where they all exist. <clears throat> and here's just a pictogram of where they could be, possibly. Uh, so they're in vinyl flooring, children's backpacks. You can see a lot of the plastics will have the flalates in them. It's, of course, important to hydrate. We'll get into a little more detail later on. Uh, but, you know, I just wanted to put this here to stress the importance of it. Uh, out here in Colorado, it's pretty cool, and a lot of my patients forget to drink. So, and it's not just, you don't just hydrate because you're sweating. You hydrate for a multitude of other reasons. You know, the amount of sweat that comes off you should not relate linearly into how much water you drink. You should be drinking consistently every single day for these natural metabolic processes. Hydration is key to proper detoxification because one of your main uh, excretory pathways will be through the kidneys, and we need enough water to do that so we don't stress them. Soft drinks and sweetened fruit juices are very poor choices. I would stay away from those as much as you can. Diet or not, soft drinks can contain uh, bisphenol A, uh, sometimes called BPA. There's a lot of BPA-free products out there, but they still probably contain flalates. It's very hard to get rid of the flalates. It, it gives it its structural integrity for the plastics. Now, you know, we kind of went over what the flalates could cause, uh, heart disease, obesity, and reproductive problems. So to also, you know, most common sweetener in the United States is high fructose corn syrup. We consume it by the truckloads. High fructose corn syrup is known to contain mercury. And the average American <clears throat> consumes about 50 grams of high fructose corn syrup a day. Uh, this, you know, this mercury exposure will cause DNA damage, lipid peroxidation, and eventually lead to certain diseases. And the neurodegenerative diseases are pretty common with excessive mercury load. On the topic of heavy metals, there's really no safe amount of the big guys such as mercury lead. Now, mercury is uh, lipophilic, which means that it's able to cross into the blood-brain barrier and cause some disruption uh, with the nerve signaling and nerve firing. It makes it very, very dangerous. It can also reach the placenta as well. We saw that chart before and how it can cause uh, cognitive dysfunction and mental retardation. Uh, I see a so strong correlation both in my practice and in the research between mercury exposure and autoimmune conditions. The prototypical autoimmune condition we see with mercury exposure is lupus, but that's not to say you couldn't have another autoimmune condition because of mercury exposure. Uh, in this article, it was concluded that mercury originating from maternal amalgam tooth fillings transferred across the placenta to the fetus, across the mammary glands into the milk, ingested by the newborn, and ultimately into the neonatal body tissues. This was uh, a quick article I pulled up about the uh, silver fillings that some women have. Like Once again, this is really important to have a conversation with your doctor about prenatal planning. I think it's important for every female to have a conversation with their physician if there is at all any chance in the future that they can get pregnant or want to become pregnant. Prenatal planning at minimum, you know, ideally it would start from childhood, <clears throat> but prenatal planning at very minimum should start at least 12 to 24 months uh, before there's any kind of urge to get pregnant. So this is just, once again, another conversation you should really have with your physician. Here's a patient that presented in my office. Uh, she was having symptoms that mimic Parkinson's, 
everything her neurology group did didn't really help. All the common uh, medications for Parkinson's. Uh, so that to me was, was glaring evidence that possibly it wasn't Parkinson's disease per se, but something that was really, you know, kind of mirroring the same symptoms as Parkinson's. So we went looking for some other things. We, you know, we took a very thorough case history and sh she used to live in a really old house. You know, she, she or her dad had a, a workshop where he welded a lot that she was always exposed to. So I figured, you know, and she was older when we ran this test. I was like, you know, let's let's run a uh, a urine toxic metal screen, and what came back for her was really high levels of lead, uh, you know, and she also had some mercury, and like I said before, there's no safe levels of mercury that we know of, so that mercury was an issue too that we really needed to address. And, and what we tried to do is is we tried to remove the lead very safely and very cautiously because if you do one of those you know, chelations or, or, you know, short-term detoxification programs, you can cause its own effects, uh, you know, its own negative health effects that, that I'll show you how here in a few minutes. But, you know, this patient, I don't think would have gotten better without getting the lead out. So we needed to prepare her body, um, make sure the detoxification pathways were in check, the kidneys were healthy, she was moving her bowels on a daily basis. And then we can go in there and start to help uh, the body remove the lead. And once we did that, she started to do much, much better. We're going to use the term xenobiotics throughout the presentation. Xenobiotics is a chemical which is found in an organism and it's not normally produced or expected in that organism. Uh, so it's just a fancy term for a toxin. <clears throat> and here's a list of them. So bacteria or, you know, living invaders could be a xenobiotic. Drugs, pesticides... Uh, certain medications over the counters and uh, pop stands for persistent organic pollutants like those things that come out of uh, exhaust pipes uh, out of airplanes and things like that what can these different xenobiotics or toxins do uh, they can accumulate they can impair proper detoxification pathways and cause you know their own kind of health damage and i just have a few here so we need proper digestion to detoxify like i said uh, one or two of the main uh, detoxification pathways will be through uh, the urine and through the feces. Xenobiotics can cause alterations in the gut microbiota and detoxification mechanisms. I have a few articles on that. I'll show you. It's very interesting. They cause intestinal permeability or uh, better known now as leaky gut. <clears throat> when you have leaky gut, you can start to activate the immune system for reasons it wouldn't otherwise be activated, which can cause or perpetuate autoimmune conditions. Uh, intestinal permeability is something that needs to be taken very seriously uh, because without addressing that, you may not get better or reach your full potential. Some more information on heavy metals and uh, just stressing that you know you should be tested for heavy metal exposure and depending on the metals and your presenting symptoms and your current health status, it may be a good idea to uh, help with the biotransformation of those metals and the eventual excretion. Environmental toxins, especially heavy metals, may prove to be previously neglected part of the puzzle. And here we were talking about uh, some of the pandemics, obesity and diabetes. Uh, the the uh, latter research <clears throat> was looking at heavy metal body burden and autoimmune conditions and how heavy metals can actually alter the immune response, switching it from non-self to self. I don't want you to get scared at this point in time where it's like, wow, these, these heavy metals... These organic pollutants, I mean, they're everywhere. I can't really do anything about it. I don't want you to feel frozen or paralyzed by this information. I want you to feel empowered, and I want to show you why here in the next few slides. We're going to get into the mechanisms of detoxification. Once again, this does get kind of heavy, but I will give you the take-home messages and things that you need and can use at home to help you and your family. Detoxification ha happens in three major phases. Uh, the two phases that are most commonly known are happen in the liver, which is phase one and phase two. So we have phase one, we have phase two, and then phase three, this is a little, a little strange, actually happens before phase one, and it happens in the gut. And then we have excretion. And we're going to break these all down a little bit further. Here's something with a few images that to help kind of uh, drive the, the message home. So we have xenobiotics or endotoxins. Uh, so xenobiotics were those chemicals 
that we're exposed to that we don't normally have in our, our own system or that accumulate over time. And endotoxins are things that we make, uh, whether it's from natural metabolic processes or because we have some sort of pathogen, they can also become toxic. So they enter the body. They have to go through phase one in the liver. There's a family of enzymes called cytochrome P450. That's what that CYP450 stands for. Uh, heavily dependent on the B vitamins. We need minerals like selenium, iron, and then N-acetylcysteine and glutathione. Those are really, really important for phase one detoxification or biotransformation. After phase one, we create an intermediate. An intermediate is something that can be neutral or highly reactive. Commonly, they're very highly reactive, which is why they need to be hurried and shuttled to phase two to be excreted. Phase two is when this toxic chemical or this intermediate is bound to something and gets pulled out of solution or gets excreted in the kidneys or feces. Now, these, like I said, these intermediates need to be cleared quickly because they cause reactive species. Uh, you know, you guys may have heard of free radical damage. This is where a lot of that comes from. A little bit comes from the natural phase one processing. A lot comes from the reactive intermediates. So they need to be shipped out as quick as possible. Uh, we can mitigate the reaction of free radical damage with some antioxidants, but it's still important that we have phase one and phase two in sync with each other to get these toxins moving quickly. Same concept, just a different look. Phase one is called oxidation. Remember, this is all in the liver. We create a reactive intermediate, and then we have phase two, which is called conjugation, and that's when we start to remove these things from the system. And as you can see, uh, each step of the way has its potential to cause harmful free radicals. What are we detoxifying? Everything we mentioned in the beginning, of course, uh, but if we skipped over anything, here it is now. So drugs, whether they're prescription, over-the-counter, uh, xenobiotics, those chemicals that don't belong, uh, you know, your standard alcohol, foodstuffs, heavy metals, caffeine, environmental pollutants, and then those POPs, those persistent organopollutants. The following has strong clinical correlation and a lot of research on the uh, heavy metal burden or toxic burden and these conditions. So we have the neurodegenerative conditions, inflammatory conditions like the arthritis and pain syndromes, allergies, autoimmunity, hypertension or high blood pressure, and then we have the diabetes or metabolic syndromes. So phase one, like I said, starts in the liver with these cytochrome P450 enzymes. They take the toxin and they do something called oxidation to it. They prepare it to be removed from the body, but it has to go through these different phases. And phase one happens in the liver uh, the main detoxification enzymes will be the cytochrome P450, but we do have some others uh, such as alcohol dehydrogenase. This is, this is going to be, uh, like I said, the take-home message. So we have some sort of drug, and it's called nonpolar, which means that it really likes to be in fat. Um, but we need to get it to be water-soluble because we want to excrete it from the kidneys or the feces. So right now, this drug, and this drug can be anything. I just used the word drug here uh, as a symbol or a placeholder. This drug needs to be oxidized by this cytochrome P450 family of enzymes. And this happens and makes the drug slightly polar. So it, it can't yet be happy in water, but it's getting there. What we get in this process is free radical production. We have to. It's not something that we can we can opt out of. So this is why it's important to to really consume those antioxidants, those fresh fruits and veggies, uh, because this process is happening every day. That drug dash O is the oxidized drug. It in itself is called a reactive intermediate, and it can also cause uh, free radical production. So it's important, like I said, to get from this phase one and really you know hurry up into that phase two. I put this in here, this is something that I think is really, really important. Uh, and this is why I don't like these, uh, you know, one size fits all or these canned detoxification programs because they're not individualized, they're not customized, it's not unique. Uh, everybody has their unique strengths and weaknesses. And when it comes to biotransformation, that can't be more true. If you see here, this is a genetic profile from one of our patients. And I have this at the end and we go into it in greater detail, but I just wanted to put it here to show you that if we push this 
uh, this was a female patient, if we pushed her into detoxification too quickly, as you can see, um, you know, I don't need to explain how to uh, use this interpretation guide, but if you can see here, all these marks here are what we call defects or SNPs in some of these cytochrome P450 enzymes. So if we pushed her too hard into phase one, she could fail, meaning that she could have excess free radical damage, she could start uh, oxidizing her fat tissue, which causes uh, cardiovascular disease and diabetes. Now this stuff is, is what happens over time, but you don't want to take someone that looks like this and throw them into a detoxification program without knowing. So I think genetic testing is the new future in biotransformation. You really have to see where you're coming from uh, to see where you can go and how fast. She also has a few defects or SNPs in a uh, glutathione pathway that's very important and then an acetylation pathway. These are both really important for detoxification in phase two. I spoke about those reactive intermediates. Uh, so you go from phase one, which oxidizes the drug. And like I said, we're going to use drug as a placeholder. Uh, and then phase two, in between phase one and phase two, we have this reactive intermediate. Now this reactive intermediate can be neutral, or like I said, a lot of the times it's uh, very harmful. And if we look here, benzene is something we're exposed to almost every day. Paints, waxes, uh, charbroiled food, uh, fat tissue from steaks dripping on an open flame. These can all cause benzene. And benzene, the reactive intermediate of it, so once, once it goes through phase one, it's in this middle stage. This middle stage can be very toxic. It can cause cancer. It can alter DNA. Uh, it can attack your nerves. It can alter immune function and ultimately just cause damage all over your body. So you can see we need to get rid of benzene, but we need to make sure that phase one and phase two are working in sync. Because if this reactive intermediate gets stuck in between, uh, we have a whole host of damage that could be caused. So what are the different nutrients that can uh, help us with phase one biotransformation? Phase one biotransformation is heavily dependent on the B vitamins. So it's important that we have enough of them. For the world that we live in today, I don't know if we can get enough from uh, foods. So I really suggest supplementation with the B vitamins. Uh, any female on birth control, any smoker or heavy alcohol drinker out there is depleted in the B vitamin. So it's very, very important at the very least to take a nice uh, high potency, high quality B complex. <clears throat> I really like to get my B vitamins from a high potency multivitamin mineral because I can get some vitamin C, maybe some quercetin, minerals uh, in, in one kind of batch. <clears throat> but it has to be enough. You have to have enough of these B vitamins to help with this phase one detoxification. And then flavonoids and phospholipids and some things that we find in coffees, teas, and cocoa can help us with phase one as well. Phase one, the natural byproduct of phase one is free radical. We talked about some of the intermediates are harmful. Uh, some of them are even more harmful than the original substance that we're trying to de detoxify, like benzene. We saw that it's carcinogenic. It could damage the cells. If we have too fast of phase one, and too slow of a phase two, we get an increase in those reactive intermediates and that free radical damage. <clears throat> phase one and phase two has to be in sync, and this is why it's important to run the genetic profiles and the urinary metabolites to see what we're dealing with and how well your body is currently equipped to deal with it. Uh, we can form superoxide radical, which is you know usually called free radical, and then there's also something that's very interesting called peroxynitrate when this free radical can combine with a uh, nitrogenous substance from natural uh, you know, protein breakdown and cause this other oxidant species called peroxynitrate. Here's the basic breakdown of how free radicals are eliminated from the body. We have the O2 here, and there's a, a guy called SOD, or some, some call it SOD. So this is superoxide dismutase, converts O2 to hydrogen peroxide, which is H2O2. This hydrogen peroxide can actually be used by the body as an antiviral, uh, antibacterial, and in some instances, people actually use hydrogen peroxide as anti-cancer. So hydrogen peroxide could be important, we just don't want too much of it. So we have another enzyme in the body that uh, is called catalase. Catalase takes this hydrogen peroxide 
and makes water and a non-reactive oxygen with it. This is a good pathway. If we don't have enough catalase, this hydrogen peroxide will actually come down here and in itself can cause lipid peroxidation, which is bad, DNA damage, which is bad. And then if it can combines with nitrite, it can actually create that peroxynitrate that we uh, spoke about before. Peroxynitrite can cause uh, a whole host of issues, and we really see it a lot with the neurodegenerative issues like Alzheimer's, dementia, Parkinson's. Uh, the NDMA receptor stimulation. So some of you out there who can't sleep that well, uh, most commonly we see this, this uh, central nervous system receptor upregulated. Uh, so we'd want to look at the possible production of peroxynitrite. Uh, there's a lot of research on peroxynitrite, autism, celiac disease, and, and a few other autoimmune conditions. So th this is something that needs to be addressed uh, if it's in formation. This is just some of the effects of peroxynitrite. So we can have a neuronal dysfunction of the motor neurons, which could mimic uh, uh, Parkinson's, or even in this uh, specific research was on ALS. Uh, multiple sclerosis, we see a lot of these, uh, you know, oxidant species, peroxynitrite. And uh, mitochondrial respiration, mitochondria are those guys that really keep the cells and you alive. And we can see that this peroxynitrite actually inhibits them from functioning properly. So this is something pretty nasty that we need to get rid of. So here's some troubles with uh, pushing detoxification is we just don't know how well your body is efficiently moving toxins through the body currently. So we once again, we need to see toxic load. Where are you at today? And then we need to run hepatic detoxification profiles and especially that genetic profile so we can see, okay, do you have enough function of that phase one do you have enough conjugation for phase two? And then how well can you produce that, that SOD or that superoxide dismutase and that catalase enzyme to mitigate the free radical damage that could come from uh, this detoxification process? And you can see if we have phase one and phase two, what they call uncoupled or out of sync, you can cause a lot of these conditions that we're trying to prevent. Here's a patient that I had, uh, ironically, recently as I was putting together this presentation. We ran her blood work because it was, uh, you know, it was kind of our, our six month checkup. And uh, it was really weird because this is the first time that we've seen any kind of presentation that looked like this. So she had a buildup of a substance called bilirubin. We can use bilirubin to see how well your body's detoxifying. So she had this buildup of conjugated bilirubin, which was just out of the normal for her. And then we had elevated different enzymes that could be elevated in liver damage. And they're pretty high. They're 71 and 46. We don't want to see either one of those numbers over 30. So this caused, you know, kind of a kind of an eyebrow to lift and, and see exactly, you know, how could this have happened? After talking to the patient a little bit further, I found out that she just came off of a, a detox regimen, and uh, we can see that there was something that reacted pretty poorly in her system, you know, to this detox regimen, whether it was the regimen itself or some sort of uh, burden that she had that was just too much, and we could start to see some, uh, you know, some organ damage. Not that it's not reversible, uh, but once again, this is the reason why we want to check these pathways before we jump into anything. Uh, C-reactive protein is an inflammatory marker. We see this elevated a lot in bacterial infections, cardiovascular disease, uh, diabetes, and different arthritis. So we want to make sure that, that we bring that down and we can use that as a marker of success. And then we can see that she was putting a lot of stress on her kidneys. We don't know from this, because I didn't know she was on the detoxification regimen, so I can't tell you if she had an infection before which inhibit detoxification or the metabolites of detoxification were actually causing stress on uh, her kidneys, which uh, allowed it to actually harbor an infection. Uh, so this is another reason why we'd want to make sure that we're ready for a program. This is that patient again that we had in the beginning, and this is her uh, genomic profile for different detoxification enzymes. Uh, there's a whole host of other ones we check for, but I just wanted to put this in here so you can see this was altered phase one detoxification. Those cytochrome P450 enzymes that we spoke about in the beginning, phase one liver detoxification. We have these uh, multiple SNPs in these uh, enzymes, which would actually cause slow or altered phase one detoxification. We also have impairment of that SOD 
enzyme or superoxide dismutase, and she has a double defect for that. So we definitely want to make sure that we were, uh, you know, supplementing with this superoxide dismutase and that catalase enzyme to mitigate that free radical damage. And then this acetylation and this uh, glutathione transferase, these are both major conjugates for drug metabolism. So what are some things you can take for the protection of the free radicals that are produced in phase one, that peroxynitrite and that uh, reactive oxygen or that free radical? Well, you could take SOD and catalase. Uh, they, they do have those in supplement form. They have to be given together, as you saw. If you gave someone superoxide dismutase, they may just produce a lot of hydrogen peroxide, which may not be the effect that you want. So you have to give catalase to break down the hydrogen peroxide into water and non-reactive oxygen. We have the vitamins that we know as antioxidants, such as A, C, E, and CoQ10. There's a lot of other ones, but those are the main ones that are going to give you free radical protection and also help you with some other uh, you know, uh, chemistries in the body. Uh, green tea, EGCG, is really uh, really effective for that. It uh, it's also helps with uh, cognition, so it could help you with memory and, and, of course, some energy. Vitamin B12, it's important to give the form hydroxycobalamin. Um, there's also methyl and cyanocobalamin. We're not really going to go into detail on why not to give those at this point. Not necessarily that they're bad, but hydroxycobalamin does seem to work the best. And then we have some witch hazel leaf that can work well. There's others, but these are the ones uh, that we like to use. For, for some of you out there who have blood chemistries ran, next time you have them out or next time you're at the doctor, take a look at your uric acid level. Uh, this isn't a, a definitive correlation, but a few articles that I've pulled up has, have actually looked at the uric acid level and the amount of peroxynitrite, and they kind of hint at using uric acid level as a marker of endogenous peroxynitrite production. So if you have high uric acid, we may assume that you have high peroxynitrite. So uric acid isn't just whether you're going to get gout or not. It could actually be used for this oxidant species that can cause all of those nasty things we talked about. Here's some things that can cause problems in phase one. We have infections. Obviously, uh, the more burden we put on an organ, the, the uh, more dysfunction we have the possibility of causing. Different foods can cause dysfunction of phase one. Nutritional deficiencies like the B vitamins we spoke about. The defects, these are really important. You have to look at the, the, uh, the genetic foundation of the detoxification process. So uh, some sort of detox, uh, detoxification genomic profile, and then also look at something called methylation, which uh, ultimately helps us get rid of these toxins in the end. Uh, and then obviously there's, there's some drugs out there that can cause issues with um, detoxification, whether they're uh, produced to cause that. There are some drugs out there that, that want to inhibit or speed up the detoxification process because of the mechanism that they're ultimately looking for. But there's ones that are, weren't uh, specifically made to do that. They just happen to as a byproduct. I spoke to about before about this, that phase three detoxifying pathway that happens before phase one, and that's in the gut. The gut is, I would probably say, uh, the first place any practitioner should start, and that's my opinion, but really there's so much reliance on the gut environment and microbiota that I don't think you can skip over it. So in our office, before we start a detoxification pathway, uh, we check the kid, you know, we check kidney health, and then we always look at how well the gut is functioning and what is actually inhabiting it at that time. There are, you know, in the the tissues of the gut lining, we actually have more of those cytochrome P450 enzymes. So more of that phase one enzyme that's in the liver we find in the gut, and you can see. You know, I see this in practice, but we can also see in the, the black and white research that patients that have a altered gut environment or are exposed to uh, these toxins called lipopolysaccharides from these bacteria actually have a decreased function in their cytochrome P450 enzyme. That's important because the body, the, the liver is expecting for the gut to take care of some of this biotransformation. And if it doesn't, it just puts more stress on phase one in the liver, which could then slow it down and create, you know, more free radical production, peroxynitrate, so on and so forth. 
So it's really important to look at the gut before you start any detoxification. If you are not moving your bowels regularly, you are not a candidate for detoxification. Uh, caffeine and cigarettes actually alter phase one uh, detoxification. So those who drink uh, a lot of caffeine and smoke cigarettes can actually speed up or slow down phase one detoxification pathway. So that's another thing to take in, into account before you jump right into something. Another nutrient that would be important would be L-carnitine. I really like L-carnitine because it's, it's something that has multiple effects in the body. For our subject matter, L-carnitine actually helps protect the liver cells. So as we utilize different cells in the body, especially in the liver, there will be some die-off. We are going to kill some hepatocytes, and it's important to protect them as much as possible. And L-carnitine is one of those that help to uh, protect the hepatocytes from the hydrogen peroxide buildup. Uh, L-carnitine is also really good to help burn fatty acids for energy, which would help with mitochondrial function and thus improving detoxification overall. So there is another mechanism to L-carnitine. Just another slide on the reactive intermediates. It's really important to clear those intermediates as fast as possible, get them into phase two, get them out of the body uh, because they can cause substantial damage. Some of the reactive intermediates are actually the known effect of the substance. And, and another way to say that is, you know, consuming caffeine as a whole molecule we're assuming, okay, well, we get the energy, we get the vasodilation, we burn a little bit of fat. And in fact, we're getting all of those effects because of the reactive intermediates. Caffeine is one of those those products that is, is really good to ask patients or, you know, you can even assess yourself. When you drink caffeine, are you one of those people who get really wired? You know, you're really sensitive to caffeine or can you have a big pot of coffee before you go to bed and have a great night's sleep. Caffeine is one of those substances uh, we ask our patients, you know, how they feel after consuming it because without running any tests, we can, you know, we can assess, okay, you do have dysfunction or you don't have dysfunction. We can't necessarily say, okay, phase one is too fast or too slow, phase two, so on and so forth, but we can say, okay, there is general dysfunction that we need to search out and figure out what is going on before we move on to the next step. Any of you out there who have ca caffeine are really sensitive or aren't affected at all, there is some issue with detoxification that needs to be addressed. We went over phase one, we did the reactive intermediates, we talked about some of the free radical damage. What happens after that? Well, we go into phase two, and this is also in the liver. This is called conjugation, or when two things attach or become married. We have the toxic substance. Uh, we made it slightly polar, so it's, it kind of likes the water, but now we need to make it love the water, and then we need to get it out of the body. And that's what phase two is all about, getting it attached to something heavy and getting it removed. Phase two, uh, phase one was called oxidation. Phase two is called uh, transferation, or uh, we use enzymes called transferases. I just put some examples here, like we can use acetate, sulfate, uh, glutathione is probably uh, one of the biggest ones, and then glucuronic acid. At the bottom, once again, an example, we have the drug. Uh, it gets acetylated by that transferase enzyme, the acetyl drug. So we move the acetyl group onto the drug, that is now called the conjugate. Those two are married together. That acetyl drug loves the water, so now we can remove it from the body. If not, if we don't acetylate that drug, then it becomes uh, a buildup, and we can start to get that free radical production that we don't want. A major pathway of phase two is called glucuronidation. I wanted to go over this one specifically because uh, we see a lot of people in our office nowadays uh, with hormonal imbalances, and this is the major pathway uh, that hormones are cleared from the body. Glucuronidation is about 53% of phase two. Uh, hormones are hydrophobic, so they don't like the water. Just like the drug we talked about in the beginning, it's afraid of the water, it really likes the fat. So to get rid of it after we use the hormone, it needs to be conjugated. It has to be attached to something that does like the water. So it can be excreted in the urine uh, and the feces. And the way we do that is we attach a glucuronide molecule to it. 
So in the purple, or maybe even on your screen, it might be the pink. We have the hydrophobic or the uh, the estrogen that's scared of water that goes through this process of phase two called glucuronidation. That then makes it like the water a lot, and we can remove it from the kidneys or feces. Why is that important? Well, the body has these uh, barometers for hormones. It knows how much it produced, it knows how much it wants, and it knows how much it actually got rid of. The problem becomes when the hormone and ligand can come together. So this is the hormone and that glucuronide that we talked about. That uh, glucuronide will drag it into the intestines. So you see over here, the, that circle and square is in the intestines. And what we want to see is this be removed in the feces. But what can happen if you have, this goes back to that uh, gut environment and why we need to fix that first. You can have these bacteria that secrete beta-glucuronidase, which break that bond between that hormone and that ligand. And that's really bad because the ligand will still be removed in the feces, but the hormone will actually come back and recirculate in the system. That's an issue because the body assumed that that hormone was being removed and now it's back in the system being able to react and attach itself to receptors and if it's estrogen, have estrogen-like effects. This is when we can start to see that scenario of uh, estrogen dominance or the alteration in sex hormones because we may have these bacteria in the gut that are causing this uh, enterohepatic recirculation. Perfect example, this was a patient that came in. Uh, she was suffering from a lot of what we consider hormonal-like symptoms, hot flashes, inability to sleep, uh, irritable for no reason, very emotional when she would watch movies that you know otherwise would, would be funny. Uh, just, just very, like I said, hormonal-like symptoms. So instead of running and jumping for the, the hormone profile, I said, you know what, let's run a stool analysis. Let's see how well you are possibly detoxifying or if you have any of these bacteria that, that secrete that beta-glucuronidase enzyme and are breaking that bond that allow your hormones to come out of uh, circulation. And in fact, she did. She had a lot of uh, this group of bacteria that present with that lipopolysaccharides and uh, that will prevent the hormone ligand from staying together and coming out of solution. So she was getting a lot of recirculation. So instead of going right away to the hormone replacement, the creams, the pills, the injections, we actually worked with her digestion and within a few weeks she felt much better. Now what we'll do is now we'll run the hormone profile, see where she's at to see if it's a primary hormone problem or it's still secondary from something else in uh, her system that we need to look for. But once again, stressing the importance of the gastrointestinal tract even when it comes to something that doesn't seem uh, directly related such as sex hormones. What can help with phase two? Uh, we went over the, uh, the inducers and the protective nutrients for phase one. So for phase two, any kind of sulfur donors, a lot of the dark greens will help, uh, broccoli, Brussels sprouts. Methylation support, uh, we have B12, B9 is helpful. Methionine, which is an amino acid, is helpful. Other amino acids, such as glycine, uh, instead of just supplementing with a, a singular amino acid, I really like to give patients whey protein isolate, gives a broad spectrum amino acid profile, and then they're also getting some protein in there. Uh, which usually helps with energy and some of the reparative functions in the body. Glucuronic acid can be had from a supplement. And then good fats, of course, such as fish, avocado, coconut. What will decrease the efficiency of phase two? Well, once again, we have uh, the B vitamins and vitamin C. So if we have a deficiency in the B vitamins or some of the antioxidants, that will definitely decrease the deficiency of phase two. Glutathione deficiency, a deficiency in a rare earth mineral called molybdenum, and then a deficiency in the amino acids. So phase two inhibition is really an issue of deficiency. Uh, we need to make sure that we have the nutrients that are proper for detoxification. This is an article I pulled up on the uh, effects of celiac disease or any kind of actually inflammatory bowel condition and how it can actually affect that cytochrome P450 enzyme and that first uh, pass metabolism that we talked about before in the gut.
that phase three actually happens before phase one in the gastrointestinal tract. Uh, the interesting part of this article was once they remove the insult, so for uh, celiac patients, it's gluten. Once they remove that, they had full uh, restoration of that cytochrome P450 enzyme in the gut. So it's impressive to see that we can actually have a uh, beneficial rebound from r removing the, the toxin. And the toxin is different for everybody. For celiac patients, uh, gluten is, is very, very toxic. So we want to make sure they stay away from that. Another thing that can affect the gastrointestinal tract and this cytochrome P450 enzyme would be glyphosate, commonly known as Roundup. It can actually suppress phase one and phase two detoxification. So it's something that I strongly suggest not using. We went through the detoxification pathways of the liver. Phase one, oxidation, which forms free radicals and those reactive intermediates. Phase two is conjugation, which makes that toxic substance really like water, thus allowing us to excrete it through the kidneys and feces. Uh, it doesn't just end there, though. We need to make sure that the kidneys are healthy or have the proper environment for uh, you know, efficient clearing. And one way to do that is increasing the alkalinity of your urine and actually whole body alkalinity. The ideal urinary alkalinity would be about 7 to 7.5 on a pH scale. This is something you could do at home with pH strips and you can run your pH from time to time. Now the best way or the ideal way to raise urinary pH would be from colorful fruits and veggies. That still doesn't seem to be enough. Supplementation with potassium citrate definitely helps and it is pretty rapid. As I said before, feces is another major clearing pathway. So we need to stimulate the removal of waste products, increase fruits and vegetables, get the fiber in there, uh, make sure the patient is hydrated. I mean, this is huge. Uh, this was probably, you know, one of the first couple slides we went over was the hydration with H2O and not the soft drinks um, or any of those artificial sweeteners. The reason why is it, can, it messes with gastric motility. Uh, we need enough water to help flush some of these toxins out of the system, and it has to be water. You want to remove processed foods, look for GI inflammation, of course, and then uh, increase fiber from fruits and veggies. If not, uh, you know, if you're still not getting enough fiber, then supplementation with fiber for uh, a short period of time, or there's some herbal preparations that help move the bowels just in the beginning. This is, I mean, this is the number one question. How many times a year should I detox? My answer to them is every single day. Every day you should detox. There are certain situations where we need to, um, you know, kind of help those processes along for an acute period of time. Um, but for the most part, you know, January is coming up right around the corner. Everybody's going to be jumping on weight loss programs or detoxification programs. Uh, I urge you to, you know, watch this webinar one more time and, and see the different things that you can do every day to really help with, um, you know, that biotransformation pathway or possibly get tested for some of the things that we went over to make sure that you're ready for detoxification and you're not gonna cause more harm than good. So here's a recap slide, you know, the, the kind of the take home message. You wanna increase your water intake. Uh, general rule of thumb is at least half your body weight in fluid ounces. Obviously, if you're an athlete, um, if you have some sort of metabolic condition, uh, that can all change. Broad spectrum, high potency multivitamin with an em emphasis on the B vitamins. Uh, you know, we're taking the multivitamin, multimineral, you're also going to get, you know, some of the, the zinc and selenium that you need. Some of the multivitamins have green tea in it, which is very, very helpful as well and a good antioxidant. Milk thistle and L-carnitine help to regenerate the liver cells. Organic beets, you can blend them up in one of those high-powered blenders. You can juice them or you can uh, bake them at low temperature. Those are really, really good for liver and bile production. Whey protein isolate, as I said before, we're not only getting the protein, uh, but we're getting those amino acids for that phase two conjugation. You need to get adequate fiber from the diet. We need to make sure you know uh, we're getting a good bulk in the stool and we're having regular movements. Probiotics are, are, can be very important for that gastrointestinal environment and antioxidants, uh, of course, because we need to make sure that we're protecting ourselves in the phase one to phase two transition period when there's a lot of free radical production. Some extra things that you know I would really stress you, you talk about with your physician is a complete assessment of your current detoxification status. 
This would be genetic testing, uh, hepatic function panels, and stool analysis at the very least. Uh, there also should be a general nutritional assessment. You should evaluate the cofactors for detoxification. And you may even need to alter your intake in certain foods or supplementation given your genetics. Um, and then you need to come up with a nutritional program for a lifestyle of biotransformation, not just your 30-day detox. And I hope by now we can see why that 30-day detox is not ideal. If you guys have any questions, here's my information. Feel free to check us out on Facebook. We're always po posting some cool research articles, uh, some recipes, and just some healthy lifestyle tips. So uh, I hope you all have a wonderful day and evening, and hopefully we'll meet up again soon. Thank you.